we've had a series of messages on uh, busyness and uh, Ruth said to me, my wife Ruth said to me um, uh, during the week, oh, you know, some days I, I just feel as though I'm going around in circles. And, uh, and I said to her, as all helpful husbands do, uh, well, perhaps we need a series on busyness and uh, we, that's what we've been doing um, here uh, at City Light. Uh, we've looked at um, the, the, the need to see that it's a spiritual battle It's not just filling up our timetable, it is a spiritual battle about what we give ourselves to, we can't just drift Um, and we've had a message on learning to live like Jesus, being present and unrushed where we are, learning to, to walk with Jesus through the day and entering into his rest as the message says, are you burnt out on religion? enter into the rhythms of his grace uh, in, in our lives and then never get too busy to fight for your family, whether it's your own family or your extended family, these relationships that God has given us are so uh, important to maintain. And then last week Don uh, shared with us on uh, why is it that we're slow, that we're still feeding on milk when uh, we uh, should be uh, feeding on meat and so the need for ongoing spiritual training to uh, to be trained by constant practice and today uh, I want to talk about the little topic um, if I could live my life over again and uh, so let's let's just come to the Lord in prayer father we come firstly this morning to worship you and we just come to acknowledge how much of a father you have been toward us in your care and your love toward each one of us and we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us and we thank you for the Holy Spirit our teacher and our guide And we pray that we would know the reality of your presence in our midst as we worship you, as we sit under your word, as we fellowship together. We pray that you would continue to make our lives as salt and light in our community. And we just pray for our community that, uh, Lord, you would continue to draw men and women to yourself and help people to enter into the amazing life that you have for each one of us. Father, we we thank you for other churches across our city and uh, pray for them as they meet this morning, today. Would you encourage their hearts in the Lord? We, We think, Father, of the situation in the Ukraine and the mess that is there and pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ that you would encourage them and help them in the midst of such a crisis. And we pray for your hand of restraint upon evil men and women who would uh, just uh, want to live in a way that is uh, just denies the reality of God and, and cares little for other people. So we, uh, we thank you now. We pray that the Holy Spirit will open up the Word of God to us this morning. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if, if I could live my life over, uh, firstly, I just want to say it's not an original uh, title or thought. I've, uh, I've read some other articles uh, on it. And, uh, and secondly, uh, when I talk about the busyness trap and... Uh, and uh, uh, and all, uh, all the, the, this, this sermon is really as much a sermon to myself as, as it is to any, uh, any of you. Uh, when my father retired, he had his own small business and he said, oh, oh son, I've, I've never been busier than, than now. And I didn't quite believe him, but having retired from full-time work, I, I can identify with him. And another man said to me, uh, you know, uh, back when I was in my early 20s, your life is only going to get busier. And I thought, oh, no, once I get over the 20s, things will uh, calm down. But uh, but no way. Um, 
And sometimes we need to hear things a few times. Uh, when um, Peter writes in 2 Peter 1, I'll always remind you about these things. And that's why I think it's good for us to have a bit of a series of messages on busyness, on, that, on the topic. It, it just helps us to chew it over um, in our thinking. And, uh, and we all need reminding, uh, you know, if I could live my life over again, how could I not be so busy? How could I not give myself to things that in the end don't really count as much as the things that do. A man, a man who had quite an influence uh, on my life uh, sat down and wrote an article uh, when he was 59, if I could live my life over. And uh, I'll put the link to the article uh, on, the, uh, on the sermon notes. But uh, this fellow Bob Boardman was 59 years old when he wrote this article if I could live my life over, and he talked about things like, I would stand more boldly on my calling that God has given me and not be so fearful, Um, that while they were young, I would spend more time with my children in, in worship, in spiritual disciplines, and in just having fun. I'd be quicker to turn from temptation and sin. I'd be more systematic and single-minded in, in reading his word and, uh, and, and following uh, Jesus. And I'd welcome, an interesting one he put was, I'd welcome trials and even failures as, uh, as builders of my poor character. You know, I've often said when I'm going through a trial, oh, I, I just, you know, it'll be great when it's over. But Jesus wants to meet us in the midst of the trial. And some things that he's going to take us through, they may be a trial for the rest of our lives. I'm not trying to dishearten you or discourage you, but sometimes we can get a wrong view that, and and instead of starting to see some of these things that happen in our lives as changing us and, uh, and developing us. And then finally he said it'd be more considerate, kind, tender and communicative to his wife and his children and his fellow workers and I think is it healthy to look back well I've got no intention this morning of loading you up with all the past regrets that you've got in your life we've all got things we wish we hadn't done or things we wished we'd done better but You know, Bob Boardman was 59 when he wrote this article and he lived another 26 years. And he started to live out some of the lessons that he'd learned. And rather than, I'm not saying I don't want to load you up with a whole lot of regrets, but I want you to stop and think about your life to date. And what are the lessons that God has been teaching me so that we can focus on what is really important for the rest of the time that God gives us. Years ago, uh, we learnt a verse for every chapter in the book of Proverbs. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. And um, we used to say uh, the little verse each day. And when you get to chapter 19, verse 20, it says, Hear counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter end. In the CSB, it says that you may be wise later in life. And, and this verse, I, as, as, I, as Don mentioned, the topic of busyness, that was the little phrase that came to my mind, that you may be wise in your latter end, that you're going to finish well. And the Christian life it's as we've said before it's it's not so much a hundred meter sprint as a, as a marathon it, it's a long it's it's day by day for the rest of our lives that we want to live in this relationship with Jesus and in in Psalm 90 it's a prayer of Moses and he prays in in verse 12 there teach us to number our days carefully 
so that we can develop wisdom in our hearts. You know, to realise the brevity of our lives, how short our lives really are and to use wisely the time we've got. Um, in a sense, this prayer is like saying, Lord, show me how my life is going to end. Now, God doesn't tell us you know, the exact time and date, but I believe by the Holy Spirit, he can start to show us where our lives are headed if we keep going the way they are and where our lives are going to head as we start to live by his wisdom. The book of Proverbs talks about wisdom, but wisdom is not just intellectual knowledge. Wisdom is like a skill in living. And God wants to develop that skill in living, in living right, so that we're wise at the end of our lives. We're wise later on in life. We're living the way God uh, intended us to live. In Psalm 73, uh, it seems a pretty hopeless uh, situation. You know, the, the writer says, look at them, the wicked. They're, they're always at ease. They increase their wealth. And I, I try and understand all this, and it seems hopeless until I entered God's sanctuary. Until I tuned in with God's picture of the world. And that's what wisdom is in a sense. To finish with God's wisdom is to enter in to God's way of looking at life and God's way of approaching different things. Remember, it says the, it comes to the end of Ecclesiastes, remember your creator in the days of your youth. And he goes on to talk about how your body starts to get old. The grinders cease because they are few. You know, you start to lose your teeth and uh, it starts to get hard to eat. And uh, you look through the windows are dimmed. You know, I need glasses now. I never used to need glasses. And, uh, and the, the, love, the one I love is the almond tree blossoms. You know, you start to get a bit of grey hair on, uh, on top of you. It's a beautiful picture. My, my barber said to me, I oh, don't call it grey hair, call it antique silver. That's a much, uh, much better approach to life. Well, the Bible calls it the almond blossom, uh, the almond tree blossoms. But remember your creator in the days of your youth. Start to think about if I could live my life over, what would I change? And, um, and so help me, Lord, to see where I'm really headed. In Psalm 39, he says, O oh Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the measure of my days? And like Don was saying last Sunday, this doesn't just happen. And, and there's a sense in which we've failed as a church if in 20 years' time you all come back and... And all you want is just to be fed with milk, that you're not growing yourself personally and growing in the word and growing in prayer. And, and you're training up your children just to be happy with milk, to happy to be just fed. If there's nothing wrong with a baby being fed with milk, it's a bit like, I guess, if you're wanting to help someone, it's step by step but you're longing that they'll grow. And uh, just as, as children grow up into adults, the same is true spiritually. We want everyone to, to receive the word, but then start to grow in their walk with God. So Proverbs is saying, listen, hear, learn. It's like an active listening with a heart to do it. And, and in each of our lives, I believe there has to come this focus this single-mindedness. Uh, one man said, um, this one thing I do, not these 40 things I dabble at. And, and I look back in my life, there have been plenty of things I've dabbled at. And uh, 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 Paul writes to Timothy, he said, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. And so often our capacity to say no 
determines how much we're going to say yes to what is right. We, we were talking about that during the week. The choices that you make each day, it's not necessarily, will I do this vile sin now or will I do it later? But so often the choices we make are the difference between what is good and what is best. There are so many things in our lives where the enemy of the best is often just good things. And uh, God wants to develop us in our thinking to be able to think down the track. I'm getting so busy. These are good things. There's nothing wrong with them. But is it the best? Is it the best for me? Is it the best for my family? For, is it the best for my group, my community in, in which I operate? And so how do we focus? Well, the Bible gives us four verses that talk about one thing. And uh, we've already touched on this passage in, um, uh, in Luke 10 about when Jesus came to visit Martha and Mary in their home. And, uh, and it says a woman named Martha welcomed Jesus into her home. She had a sister called Mary who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what Jesus said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. They weren't bad things. They were good things, things that needed to be done. But Martha got distracted and she came up and said, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care? Well, saying to Jesus, the person who cares about you most of all, above any other person, he cares. Don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to give me a hand. Tell her to help me. And the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. You can just picture him. Martha, Martha, you are just so worried and upset about many things. But one thing is necessary. One thing is necessary. And Mary has made the right choice. You're preparing all these meals. Mary has chosen the best meal to sit at the feet of Jesus and, and eat his meal. You know, one, one uh, person said to me, uh, said, uh, I, uh, he, he said, uh, when uh, the importance of, of feeding on the word, whether it's, uh, you know, reading the word and studying it and memorising it and meditating on it, uh, he, he said to me, uh, he said, uh, I can't remember what I read five years ago. It's a bit like a meal. If you asked me, what did I eat today, uh, this day, five years ago, I couldn't tell you. But I know if I hadn't been having those meals, I wouldn't be standing up here today. And, and God says it's the same with our feeding on the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we, we, we've just got to see how important our spiritual food is uh, in in our lives. As a as a young Christian, um, someone shared with me a little booklet called "My Heart, Christ's Home." It was sort of quite a popular book back uh, a long time ago. Because I'm I'm 67, and some of my memories now are many many years ago. But um, but uh, in the the writer took the idea which comes out in uh, in Ephesians three that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that Christ may settle down and be at home in your hearts by faith, and um, and in Second Corinthians thirteen he says, recognize that Christ is in you. As Christians, we are in Christ. But Christ is also in us. By his spirit, he comes to dwell within our bodies. And, uh, and so part of the picture that this little booklet created was my life being like my house. And Jesus comes into each room of my house. And uh, he came into the study. And uh, this room was uh, rather intimate and comfortable. I liked it. Had a fireplace, overstuffed chairs, a bookcase and a sofa. And he said, well, this is a great room. Let's, let's meet here every day. And, uh, and, and, well, as a young Christian, I thought, that's fantastic. 
we'll, we'll start the day together or sometime through the day we'll meet and, uh, and talk with Jesus and, uh, and he'd take one of the 66 books of the Bible down from the shelf and we'd open it up and we'd, uh, we'd read it. And, uh, but little by little, under the pressure of many responsibilities, the time began to be shortened. And, and after a while I said, oh, I'm, I'm too busy to read God's word. And it wasn't intentional, but I, I know I can be, I, I, you know, I target to read a certain amount of the Bible every year and I can be up and down in it. And we've got to keep thinking, where do I want to end up? And, uh, and, and uh, I remember, and, and the fellow in the book says, well, one morning I remember I was in a hurry and I was racing down the steps on my way out and, and I just happened to glance in the study door and there was the Lord waiting for me. And I said, oh, Lord, I've just got too busy to spend time with you. And he said, never forget Spending time in the word, reading the word and praying, it's never meant to be simply something you tick the box. And never forget that it's Jesus who longs to meet with you more than you long to meet with him. In, in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. The gospel is good news, not just because he forgives our sins, but it's like a multifaceted diamond. And another facet of the gospel is that Jesus himself calls us into a fellowship with him, into a relationship, a friendship, a deep caring for him. And so when I say to you, it's one thing is necessary to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn. It, it's not about adding a legalistic burden on top of you. Never forget that Jesus is calling you to have fellowship with him. He's more excited about meeting with you each day in the word than you are. And we can get so busy. You've been thinking the wrong way about this. And so keep meeting with God now I know some of you have got to get up at you know you've got a five o'clock start at work or you've uh, you know or the kids are screaming or whatever I'm just saying don't set a legalistic thing that I've got to do it say Lord I thank you that you want to meet with me today and you want to speak with me through your word and sometimes it's going to be 10 verses. Sometimes I'm going to read a couple of chapters. Uh, you know, don't, don't get locked into ticking off, I've read that chapter. I, plenty of times I've sat down and I've had my little reading plan and I've ticked off the chapter and you go out the door and I suddenly think to myself, did I really hear Jesus' voice through his word? Did I really talk with him and just unload my life with him? And, and so I, I just want to say to you, there's one thing is necessary, that we sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him. He who hears my word, if, if you listen to him, then you'll be wise at the latter end, at the end of your life. You know, Psalm 119 was another beautiful verse we learned. I, I considered my ways and turned my feet to thy testimonies. I hastened and did not delay to keep your commandments. It's a beautiful picture of meeting with Jesus, looking at his ways in the word, looking at our ways and turning to follow him each day. So single-minded devotion to Jesus, single-minded prayer, looking at Jesus. We go back to Psalm 27 verse 4. I've, I've asked one thing of the Lord. It's what I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, gazing on the beauty of the Lord and seeking him in his temple. My heart uh, says this about you. Seek his face. Lord, I will seek your face. 
years ago, uh, we had a sermon by a man called uh, Peter Lord on these verses. And, uh, and he said, it's so easy in our lives, in the midst of the busyness, to seek his hand and not his face. And what he meant by that was, we can just rush in to talk with God and say, give me this. Or I, I can look back in my prayer life and I can see how so often I've just raced in to talk with God and, and, and I'm, sometimes I'm saying, Lord, I need this, I need that. Sometimes I'm even telling him what to do. And, and the psalmist is saying, first of all, seek his face. Seek who God is and come to think about who God is. And it starts to put us in the right place, the right perspective. Um, it became a bit of a family joke, uh, you know, because uh, Peter Lord used the illustration of, a, of a, a man coming back from a business trip and all the kids race up and say, uh, what have you got for us, Dad? What have you got for us? And the wife says, it's just good to see you home. And he said, why can't our prayer life be like that? We come to God, what have you got for us, Dad? I need uh, uh, God, what, what, I need this, I need that. Sometimes it's good to just sit with God and behold his beauty and think about his forgiveness and his faithfulness and his love and the way he's working out his purposes in our lives. And uh, it's, it's praise in a sense. And sometimes I feel I've struggled with praise to just acknowledge who God is. And, uh, and then thanksgiving, thanking him. You know, uh, one of the things I find helpful is to go to the Psalms. Like Psalm 103, I will bless the Lord and all that was within me bless his holy name. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems you from the pit. He satisfies you with good things. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. And my favourite bit, your youth is renewed like the eagle. God is a beautiful God. He's an amazing God. He's a, an awesome God. And uh, it's so good for us to start our prayer. It's like um, in uh, Psalm 61 where it says, I call to you from the ends of the earth. When your heart is without strength, lead me to a rock that is higher than I. And as we say one thing, I've asked of the Lord, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord and behold his beauty. I want you to start to think more about prayer as first of all, coming into his presence and admiring his beauty. And then that starts to put us in the right framework I can come in, uh, as the verse says, whenever my heart is overwhelmed, I cry to you. And, and we're all going to have times where we're overwhelmed. And God says, first of all, come into my presence and see me for who I really am. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call unto me and I will answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things that you don't know there's so much we don't know about what God is doing but he says come call to me and and I'll show you what I'm doing you know sometimes prayer is uh, it's like Peter when he started to walk on the water toward Jesus and he started to sink and he said Lord save me you know sometimes our prayers like that we, we just cry out to God from our heart other times we're sitting there and we're just thankful for who God is and what he does. In Psalm 5, 3, he says, In the morning, Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I'll plead my case and I'll watch expectantly for, Lord, what you're going to do in the day. So one thing is necessary to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn. One thing is necessary in our prayer to really meet with God. In, when you go then to John chapter 9, the man who was born blind and he said, one thing I know, once I was blind and now I see. 
And, he said, and, and Paul wrote to Timothy, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to guard what has been entrusted to me to that day. God wants us to live in the reality of I know. And so often you'll meet Christians who'll say, well, well, I guess I hope so. And even that's not the Bible's word for hope actually has a great certainty to it. It's not wishful thinking. And God longs for our Christian lives, if we're going to finish well, that we start to grow in our assurance, in our certainty. Uh, in uh, Second Peter chapter 1, his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him. By these he has given us very great and precious promises. And I want to say to you as you sit at the feet of Jesus, as you talk with him in prayer, ask God to give you some promises from his word. And I remember the fellow who helped me to become a Christian, shared the gospel with me. He got me to learn 1 John 5, 11 through to 13. He who has the Son has life. And there were plenty of times where I felt, oh, I've let God down, I've, you know, I've sinned. I, and, and he just encouraged me to keep coming back to the promises. You never got eternal life because you were good enough. You never got it because you'd never failed. You got it because you entered in to what Jesus promised to give you. He who has the Son has life. And then he writes, I write this to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. God never intended that we should live with, with oh, am I, am I saved today? Am I not? You know, does God care for me? He wants us to, and we grow in this faith, but he wants us, he longs for us to live in the certainty of his promises, what he shared with us. I could say a lot more on that, but finally, the fourth phrase that comes up is where Paul in Philippians 3 uh, says, this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. And Paul had this aim in his life that I may know him and the power of his uh, resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And if you want a life objective, that's a beautiful verse, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him, to know him and to help others come to know Jesus. And God wants us to live in the forgetting of all the mess that our lives have been before. In one sense you say, oh, well, that, that contradicts what you're saying about if I could live my life over. But, but God is saying forgetting the mess that's happened and moving forward now in the assurance of what God has done. God was rich in mercy and because of his great love that he had for us, he made us alive in Christ even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. He's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. You're saved by grace, not by works. And we are his workmanship. That, the word has the idea of a poem that he's writing. He's writing a new story for your life, which comes from his grace and his work. So... We've come, in a sense, to the end of our series on busyness, but our application has only just begun. And let me encourage you, not, don't get discouraged, but do sit down and think, what are the lessons that I've learned from my life so far, both the good and the bad? And because God wants us to number our days, he longs for us to learn, to listen with an active heart, to apply what he wants uh, in our lives, to be single-minded in our devotion to Jesus, in our prayer to see him for who he really is, to, to know him and be certain 
taking his promises that he's made to us and living out his gospel each day. Hear counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter end. Our church, it, it, we just long that each one of you will grow in these things. We're not here to load you up with burdens to try and control you. As, as Paul said to the Corinthians, um, we won't burden you. I'm not seeking what's yours, but I'm seeking you because we want to help each other to really grow into the Lord and, and to know him more and more. Let's, let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to come before you and we thank you that you actually long to meet with us and you've called us into your fellowship help us to, to number our days to count our days to really go forward in what is necessary in life and Lord we do thank you for each other may we learn to more and more be encouraging one another in the Lord Amen. We're going to uh, have a time around uh, the Lord's uh, table and you are welcome, uh, if you've come to know the Lord Jesus, you're welcome to join with us as we gather around the table. And uh, at the table we remember that Jesus died for us and rose again from the dead. He loved us and he gave himself for us. And uh, so as we partake of uh, the elements, the bread representing his body that bore our sins, the, the cup representing his blood that washed away all our sins, we thank you, Lord, that you just cared for us so much. So as we come around the table, let us remember our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.